I want to get started on uh, as we continue talking about the mysterious ways of God and tonight <clears throat> we're going to delve into the thought of uh, the mystery of the throne of iniquity it, it is our chapter 9 and uh, we've had chapters we've labeled them chapters but some of the chapters were so extensive we couldn't get them in one week we had to divide a chapter up and so we're going to talk about the throne of iniquity and uh, I enjoyed uh, following through or following what uh, Dr. Small brother Doug Small was showing uh, us me as I was studying this material and he started off here saying sin sin has an enticing quality about it it's neither uh, natural or is it rational uh, let me let me repeat that sin has an enticing quality about it that's not natural and it's not rational and he gives a for instance why would a gentleman or a woman force themselves to inhale smoke hold it in all the time it's burning their lungs knowing eventually it could kill them and that every cigarette that they smoke takes 10 minutes off their life but they're so enticed by it i've even heard people say i'm, I'm nervous i need to smoke a cigarette so they can calm down and and but it is so enticing it's like i just can't i can't stop i can't quit the next one says why would this same person he said uh, this man force himself to drink why would he force himself to drink knowing that his emotional control is going to diminish and that his behavior under the sedated influence may be embarrassing to him or his family and that coming out of that drunken stupor is going to be painful we're still talking about the mystery of iniquity why would that person man or woman risk for a moment of pleasure the possibility of contracting a sexually transmitted disease or the risk of contracting aids sin is destructive sin is so destructive yet it is enticing and addictive it is a mystery and as i mentioned the other day we have told our children hey don't stick that paper clip into that receptacle don't lay your hand on the eye of the stove uh, we'll tell our young kids not to do something and they will go headlong and do what we've asked them not to do they're they're small and and get hurt with us standing there it's like the little fellows they get super speed and they're right on it and why do they do that it's sin that david said look we were born in iniquity brought forth in the sin and so we were born with sin in us and without the power of christ at work in our lives we would yield to sin now this scripture here um the the psalmist said in psalms uh, 94 verse 20 he says shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee am i reading the right one shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee which frameth mischief by a law let me read it again shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with you which frames mischief by a law so let's notice for a few moments iniquity has a throne the scripture says the throne of iniquity iniquity has a throne which means it is empowered the psalmist asked a question should we allow iniquity to have fellowship with us should we allow the word fellowship in the hebrew hebrew is chabar which means to be joined to specifically by casting a spell uh, being charmed under the power thereof we just come out of the halloween season and in different places i heard that song i'll put a spell on you and now you're mine anybody that song's scary when you apply that song to uh what we're talking about here fellowship means to be joined to but to be cast a spell upon or being charmed under the power of the kingdom of iniquity captures a person by use of spiritual powers that are utterly seductive then the scripture says that 
uh, which frameth mischief by a law, that it frames mischief. The word frame there, frameth in the King James, it, it's yatsar, which means to squeeze into shape. Now, I wish my picture was a little bigger. Uh, I had to apologize for Sister Ellen. She had the pictures bigger, um, but um, I shrunk the picture so I can make the words bigger for me. Okay, so I'm going to, that's that A-G-E thing, Brother Mike, uh, reminds me of all the time. But it means to squeeze into shape, just like you see this potter doing to this clay. The idea of a potter squeezing, it, he gently squeezes it, shapes it, molds it, uh, turns it, and slowly conforms it to the shape that he wants it to be in. Now, I'm going to throw this in there. It's not in our scriptures, but the idea uh, in the prophet that talked about, uh, God, you are our father, and we are, we are the clay. And that, that, that idea is God wants to mold our lives into what he wants it to be and the thing is we'll either be molded by God or we're going to be molded by that throne of iniquity so iniquity <clears throat> joins itself to us it brings us under the power of its spell it squeezes us into an evil mold until uh, we become the mere vessel of Satan Satan is the king of iniquity. We are molded then by his manipulative hands, if you will, his cohorts, his, his demon minions that seek to uh, tempt us, cause us to sin, and then keep us there and mold us into the vessel he wants us to be. The result of that is mischief. The, a mal is the word and a better translation uh, for that is misery the NIV version of the scriptures actually puts the word misery where mischief does in the King James misery but it could have been equally translated as sorrow as pain and as travail the phrase by a law is translated in the NIV as by its decree so when we read in the King James by a law, here we see in the NIV by its decree. So the throne of iniquity starts molding a person into the shape Satan wants them to be. And it has a decree that it speaks over, over our lives should we yield to that spirit. And then we are led around. We're in bondage to the hands of Satan, if you will, by that law or by that decree. That is iniquity. Once it has you under its spell, under the power of its throne, its dominion, it decrees upon you pain and sorrow, travail and grief. And then what is birthed from that is not life, but death. I, I, I can't uh, understand this, but I, I know of people who, even as grown adults with children, who find themselves, they, they look forward to an opportunity, if they could, to get, to get wasted. Look forward to an opportunity uh, to get hammered out of their head. It, it's like the last time that they were hugging the porcelain throne wasn't enough to break them uh, from that. I, I can't wrap my head around grown adults with children who are trying to make life happen still look forward to doing things that adolescent teenagers wanted to do in high school I don't understand maybe it's cause I lived on this side of the cross so much I just don't understand and so with that being said I don't really care to understand I just thank the Lord that we have freedom in Jesus Christ I want to talk about the king behind the energy of iniquity and he can be seen in Ezekiel 28 verse 15 and the scripture says thou was perfect in the ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was a found in thee till iniquity was found in you this is a prophetic word from God and he is speaking through the prophet Ezekiel and he's speaking straight to the face of Satan and he's saying you were perfect in the ways from the day that you were created but iniquity was found in you the principal defect of Lucifer was iniquity it is his power, his deadly spell, uh, which has spun off the throne of iniquity. To convey that iniquity as a throne in itself is very interesting. Iniquity has a throne. Um, new song. Sing a song. He's the resident king in the castle of my heart. And that has touched me so many times because I, 
either I will push God off and try to reign there or Satan will reign on the throne of my heart but we have a throne in here and, and that throne will give to, a way to submission to a more powerful king, either King Jesus or the king on the throne of iniquity. Amen? So as we continue to think about it, Lucifer draws his power from the force of iniquity. Um, now, I'm going to throw this out there. You may feel like my theology is messed up, um, but just bear with me. Anyone ever remember hearing the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily say that that's just Christians to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. But God is a three times holy God. Holy, holy, holy. And so when we close our eyes here, whether we're saved or not, I believe that passageway throws us into the presence of this awesome God. But because he's so holy, and as he told Moses, no flesh has seen me and lived, I believe the very holiness of God repels the sin that was in the life of that unbeliever, and they are thrown out of the presence of God into eternity lost without Jesus. That's just my opinion. That may be messed up theology, but if to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord, and if we're saved and righteous, we're going to stay with him. If we're not, we're forever eternally separated from him. And iniquity is essentially the power that comes from pushing against God. Lucifer's power is only the echo of his defiance against God. It's like the backfire of an engine. It's an aberration an energy release not to propel the car forward but it is discharged in reaction i think i remember dad talking about making his cars backfire he would cut them off and cut them back on as they were and it would make it backfire now <clears throat> the only thing a backfiring of a car has ever made you do is drop on the ground because you thought somebody was shooting a gun it didn't necessarily hurt you uh it, it but it, it it made you almost hurt yourself but you take that same car and if somebody hits you with it the car propelled forward can hurt you here's what it's saying that satan's power is defiance against god it is like the backfiring of an engine it makes a noise but it doesn't have the same equality as the power and the authority and the holiness of god it's just a discharge in the reaction of coming up against the sovereignty of god God is so powerful and so awesome that his silent presence in the face of defiance causes a deflection of energy called here, we call, we're talking about iniquity. It forms the illusion of power in this tyrannical creature called the devil. That's why when we as children of God, uh, the scripture tries to let us know we don't always get it brother larry but greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world but satan and that means he doesn't have authority over us we have authority over him the scripture talks about his place is under our feet and so he comes at us in such a way so that we don't put him in his place we have authority in god over over him he has an elusive way he's illusional tries to convince us he's the father of lies he's transformed into an angel of light to convince us that that's how things really are but it's just an illusion he's just the devil we have authority over him amen in truth satan has no power he only uses it in an aberrant way uh it, it's a, a, a negative if you will reflective it's the uh the negative end of the battery god's the positive end of the battery uh i don't know i'm trying to put it put it in words that we can understand uh satan's god is powerful and satan tries to be but he's just not there and he tries to convince us it is the reaction to the sovereignty along with a god-given spiritual capacity that creates the illusion of power revealed in iniquity Satan gives us the illusion that he is, uh, the, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah that reigns. 
but it also says that Satan is as as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour you see there is the the roaring lion the lion of the tribe of Judah that reigns and because he reigns we are victorious and then there's the one who walks about roaring as a lion but all he has is a bunch of noise he can do nothing with the people of God we are victorious over him because we're actually in the kingdom of the king who gives us the authority over the one that is just making a bunch of noise amen illusion of power it is the rejection of holiness that creates the vacuum of sin and death which ultimately ends in, immor in immorality. The vacuum of holiness. I heard one say that there's a God-shaped hole inside of every one of us that only God can fill. But oh, how men and women, boys and girls, try to fill it with, with sexual excursions and alcoholism and drug abuse and, and cheating and lying and so many other things trying to fill that vacuum and day after day they just end up empty and more empty uh, it, it, they can't fill it because only God can fill that hole iniquity is driven by self-centeredness by our attention being on us I think I said it Sunday uh, and, and someone slipped up now and, and it's easy to do so when you're standing in front of a congregation everybody's looking at you talking about the nerves it works on you and, and, and a lady one time did say y'all worship me as I sing now she didn't mean it she didn't mean for y'all to really worship her but I've met people who actually felt that way y'all worship me as I sing I've, I've been music, music minister at other churches where if, if people didn't get Sunday morning stage time to sing their solo, they would get angry. They would call the pastor and want to have a meeting with the music minister because they weren't getting enough stage time. That's self-centeredness. That's not humility. That's not, hey, look, stick me in a corner and give me a microphone. I'm singing for Jesus. It doesn't matter if anybody sees me. It, it self-centeredness uh, iniquity is driven by self-centeredness it is the attempt to differ dif differentiate from God to hold on to uh, an attempt to be a source of life apart from God that is impossible I gotta testify for a little bit sister Ellen I finished a little run last night and I posted a little thing on Facebook and a young man that I went to high school with that Satan has just come against his life, destroyed his, his, his marriage, and, and, and he's somewhere now, some, and he had a call of God on his life, and he's not fulfilling that call, and he's always down on himself. And he, 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 he texts me, he said, man, um, he said, I want to let you know, thank you for your post. He said, you are always an inspiration to me. And the Holy Ghost came over me, because what he said was, I know I'm not a part of your flock and my soul doesn't matter, but you inspire me. And I said, hold on. I said, that's a lie of the devil. Your soul matters to God. And scripture started flooding my mind. And I was talking about um, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and God demonstrates his own love. And I just, I don't know, he got a text about this long. Now, whether he read it or wanted to read it, he got some of it. Because see, the devil the devil wants us to feel like uh, we, we're, we're worthless, uh, that we can't get back to God because we've gone too far. And if we're breathing, no, even if we're not breathing, God can revive and restore. Iniquity is driven by self-centeredness. It's the attempt to differentiate from God, to hold on, attempt to have life apart from God. That's impossible. That is why iniquity is a mystery because it tries to lead people to believe that they can live a life without him, can sustain and become perfect without God. Lucifer, it was the illusion of a self-rule, of autonomy, of independence, even from God. It's heady, it's intoxicating, it's spellbinding, it is blinding. Iniquity offers us the illusion of sitting on a throne. I'm in control. I am large and in charge. At the very least, the throne offers, uh, is offered, it is the self-empowered throne of my own life. 
iniquity tells me you can be the center of the world. You can be or should be in charge. But even that throne, the throne of my heart, is reserved for God and God alone. Not even I have the authority to sit on the inner throne legitimately. To do so is to declare war against the God that created this temple and created that throne for him to sit on only. Amen? Look at what Ezekiel 28 and 2 says. Thus saith the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the sea, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Again, we see God speaking to the devil. He did say here, though you're a man, he's letting him know you're fallible you were created i am god and you're not but you have set your heart as if you are god there there's where we need to pray because when the leaders of our country feel like we don't need him anymore then then we've made a u-turn in the wrong direction now we're we the church we're going up we're not going down we're going up we're going over we're going to be victorious and I, and I gotta, I gotta confess. I, I, I'm like, Lord, you know, uh, that Lord, is it okay if I? I mean, the vote's over, so I can't sway you to vote, can I? I'm like, Lord, uh, we, we need Trump in office. Lord, I pray, you know, give us four more years so the church can get busy doing. The Holy Spirit says you need to be getting busy doing anyway, regardless of who's in office. And so, church, we're going to get, get to the holy. We're going to get to God. We're going to find some holiness around here. We're going to find some Holy Ghost. And we're going to find what it is that we can do in spite of COVID. And we're going to do it until Jesus comes. We got to do it. We have no other choice. We're the called out ones. The greatest times in history that the church grew and burst its seams and did great things for God. It's when they were under some of the greatest persecutions. Study church history. Some of the greatest anointings and things that God did through the church have had to do when the church uh, found themselves needing him more than they needed anything else amen yeah give him praise would you I might not I might not sister Ellen iniquity manifests itself as self-centeredness as a self enthroned and thus the replacement for God thus a replacement for God and the very idea has a spiritual energy that is attached to it it has an unholy anointing about it um I gotta throw this in there anyone ever been in sitting in a service and God began to move and it's like the in a good way the hair would stand up on the back of your head and you could feel the Holy Ghost I was I was in a prayer time the other day and I declare it it it's like you ever had anybody maybe a little puppy like that in your ear and you like that it's like I, I i felt and heard someone right here breathing as i was praying i'm like oh my god that's a holy spirit that's god letting me know hey son I, i'm i'm right here i i am right here with you but then there is that time where you've been in a situation we've had it here with an evangelist and I remember uh, that uh, the evangelist prayed for a person and they fell out on the floor and was rolling all around kicking and stomping and 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 screaming out loud and and and, and immediately in my spirit I'm like that's not God there was no Holy Spirit in that there may be a whole lot of devil in that, but there was no God in that at all. And so our bodies respond to the spiritual. There is an anointing, and then there's an anti-anointing. The Holy Spirit has a tongue, but the devil has a tongue. He can speak in tongues too. He can mimic. And if we're not discerning in the Holy Spirit, we'll say, oh man, woo, they are spiritual. Yeah, they are, but it's from the demonic. We need to, there is an unholy anointing about this, a throne that only is an illusion. It never materializes into a freedom. It brings one under a, that decree we talked about in the scripture, under the law of the principle of iniquity. And it is in that power that Lucifer himself is operating. So Lucifer works off of the energy of iniquity. Simply put, iniquity is lawlessness or a refusal to submit to order. 
to give appropriate deference to authority or to respect to the perimeters of control established by one of uh, superior rank. You remember, we just addressed how God is a God of love, but he's a God of limits. And Mount Sinai teaches us the limits that God, God uh, here, we uh, must defer authority to the one that is higher than us that those are the limits it is the substitution of my way for God's way it is the rejection of restraint it includes the refusal to stay in my place or my office to limit the expansion of power and control by self-initiative now uh, we studied this in in another one of our uh, previous studies David David violated the holiness of God when he stood on his rooftop and and he looked on Bathsheba and he took her as his own and he had her husband killed and tried to cover it up he violated the holiness of God now King Saul David repented King Saul didn't we never saw where he violated the holiness of God but when God said this is how I want you to handle this this and this Saul did it his own way and when the prophet come ask him then he blamed somebody else and what Saul did was he violated the authority of God and when you start violating the authority of God your self-centeredness says I can make this decision I don't even need God God says from this day forward the kingdom is ripped from you the anointing lifted off of him and evil spirits began to taunt him because he violated the authority of God Lucifer and iniquity you were in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was your covering the sardius topaz diamond beryl onyx jasper sapphire turquoise emerald with gold the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes uh, was prepared for you on the day you were created now God's saying how beautiful Satan was in his creation now he said you were created but Satan wanted to uh, pose himself to poise himself as if hey I wasn't created I just was and I made myself just was I know there's a lot of good grammar in that right <clears throat> this is a description of Lucifer he was in the garden with God he was there before Adam he was replendent with beauty and awesome in glory the richest terms has to be used to define his glory the reference to pipes is generally conceived to be a recognition that he had musical capabilities some would even say that Lucifer was the music director the praise leader in heaven some said that those pipes uh, were actually made into his body that he just played music that's how he glorified God he was beautiful to look upon and the music that he played just just so moved heaven that was his role in heaven he was the choir leader he was a cherub an angel of the highest order stationed around the throne specifically to give praise to God we got to throw this in there y'all may have never been in a church where music was a problem but I tell you what there there have been times where music ministers have about torn churches all to pieces because they felt like they were so good they did not have to submit to the authority of that local pastor and the authority of that local uh, uh, church and pastor's council they did what they wanted to regardless of what the pastor would ask and and they would get influence over people and get a following they'll tear the church up and go start a church down the road and it's this same thing we're talking about here and it stems from the ultimate choir leader that was in heaven that played music in heaven for God but he became self-centered and that's where that spirit comes from the difference between a cherub and a seraph uh, appears only in their mobility the seraph fly about the throne covering their faces and their feet and what do they do they cry holy 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 uh, the cherubim uh, appeared fixed on some occasion they appeared to bear God up if you will in Ezekiel 28 and 14 it says thou art the anointed cherub that covers if he Satan was the cherub of music and praise or praise with music then he covered God with musical praise and I have set thee so God said you were upon the holy mountain of God thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire he was saying satan you were right there with me you were 
here's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and then there's Satan, his music minister in heaven. The term anointed, uh, meanshack, indicates a winged creature, one that expands uh, the dimensions of his being by the stretching out of his wings. And then the next uh, term, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that, indicates that one which wraps itself around another or specifically defends, covers up to shield and protect. God was covered with the, pra- the musical praise that was that, that came out of the very vessel, his body of Satan himself when he was in heaven as Lucifer. Then Lucifer would have been one of the closest angels to God, one that was charged with protecting the glory of God, uh, of, covering, uh, of covering the glory. That's why when we hear a song that begins to ring out in our spirit, we start feeling the glory of God. That music, it begins to do something in the heavenlies. And then God starts pouring something back. We start feeling his glory because music starts, when we sing and it, it's coming out of us and we're just lifting God up, that's what begins to happen, uh, happen in heaven and God starts pouring heaven down here amen but for him such a role was not adequate enough it wasn't just enough to be close to God to cover God's glory with his musical praise he wanted to be free he wanted to be God he was in the holy mountain in heaven the consecrated center of God's glory. He has been in the place of the fire of God's glory. Verse 15 of Exodus 28 tells us, Thou were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. He was perfect until he became self-centered and iniquity was found in him. Uh, Whole, without blemish. He was well, upright, undefiled truthful full of integrity and until iniquity was found in him verse 16 look what it says by the multitude of thy merchandise they they have filled the midst of thee with violence let's look at how it reads and you have sinned therefore i will cast you out as profane out of the mountain of god i will destroy you O covering cherub from the midst of of the stones of fire can you can you picture that being being cast out of the presence of god when you you had it made and this was satan he had it lucifer had it made but because of his self-centeredness he was cast out of the holy glorious presence of god the phrase by the multitude of thy merchandise is an earthly metaphor more descriptive of the king of Tyre who is being used to illustrate iniquity at the level of an earthly king, but it's also Lucifer. In other words, the behavior of the king of Tyre becomes a window to which we can also look at and see the attitude and actions of Lucifer himself. The term multitude means great or greatly increased or to grow in number or intensity lucifer's iniquity moved him out of his place and with an incrementally increasing amount of presumptive liberty he increased his self-initiated latitude now i'm learning from this there there's seraphim cherub and their angels and we've always because of their creation that angels do not have self-will they were created and they do what they're supposed to do but evidently god gave gave will free will to the cherub because satan chose to do what he did satan chose the term merchandise not only refers to the trade or that which is traded but also to the trade route it refers to the trade it refers to that which is traded and it refers to the trade route itself here's the implication lucifer exerted his influence with an increasingly wide span of liberty trading his rebellious notions far and wide in the angelic community near and away from the throne he became the if you will the drug dealer of heaven he trafficked in the drug of iniquity 
He cast the spell of rebellion upon those who took the drug in the process. He and all the angels caught in the snare of iniquity with him, they became fractured. The term profane actually means worthless by means of a wound or it refers to a split in a piece of wood by means of a wedge. Lucifer uh, is a is both a victim and the chief victimizer his own iniquity has created in him a self-delusion he left the haven of his place and has begun uh, and ha he has begun to come apart to lose his wholeness he will come to destruction he will come to destruction you know hell was not created for for people heaven was created for people hell was created for the devil and, and his demons it was a place of punishment where satan and ultimately in eternity is supposed to go now if you and i refuse we follow this same pattern we're preaching tonight and we refuse to follow after god and his holy and righteousness if we refuse to let him be the god of the throne of our heart then we by virtue of the iniquity in us we will be expelled into uh, the, the depths of the flames of hell. Not that God is sending us there. We send ourselves there by rejecting the awesome plan of salvation that God has given us. Verse 17 says, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold thee. Verse 18, you have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It shall devour you, and I will bring thee to ashes. <clears throat> I'm trying to watch my time. Upon the earth in the sight of all those that behold you. You know, some unnamed, what some would say probably some small standing over in the corner, puny angel, and God's going to say, hey, squirt, come over here. Take Satan and bind him and cast him into the, that's what's going to happen. Some unnamed, nameless angel is going to have the authority given to them by God, and he's going to bind that devil and throw him into the bottomless pit. That's what the Bible says. That's how powerless he truly is. But oh, how many people that he has convinced that he is. I remember uh, reading up back in the day when they would do the, the videos of back masking and hard rock and all that, that they were actually hard rock singers and, and musicians who believed that hell was going to be one big party when everybody gets there and Satan was going to be the king and they're just going to drink and drug and have everything that they want. And that's that illusion that Satan has passed on. His, his iniquities are now multiplied. His own passion, his own fire will ultimately consume him he will self-destruct verse 19 all they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more that's prophetic you're going to be a terror but then you're not going to be any more god's allowed him to be loose for this period of time but his time is limited his time is limited. Amen. Can you picture in your mind that God's going to wipe away all our tears? He's going to glorify this broke down, busted up body of ours. It's going to be glorified and we're going to be like Jesus. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, and no more devil and sin to have to deal with. And in, in heaven forever, in the presence of God, we're going to worship and glorify him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Shall not be anymore. He's not going to be, but we're going to live for eternity. The origin of evil has always perplexed people, men. God did not create evil. He is a holy God. He's incapable of evil. He is not, as are the pagan gods, a mixture of good and evil. He's not the good and the bad side, the dark side of the force. James says in James 1.13, For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. The Bible tells us. Notice, God is so holy that he cannot be tempted. Well, can we say then, if we're full of God, then the God in us can maintain us, can sustain us through temptation? 
That, that is, there's nothing in God capable of responding to sin. Further, God is so holy that he does not have the capacity to tempt. He would not know how to frame a solicitation to, to cause a man to sin. That is, holiness of the highest degrees. Holiness of the highest degrees. So where did evil come from? Where did evil come from? Who created evil? Uh, you know, because that, that trick, if God created everything, then didn't he create evil? And, and no, he did not. We're going to talk about that. We speak of good and evil, light and darkness, as if they were opposites. They are not. If one builds a fire, cold disappears. If the light is turned on, darkness is overcome. Darkness does not have an instinctive and dominating capacity. Darkness is really only the absence of light. There is not a darkness switch to be turned on or off. Darkness has no primary or incontrovertible power. It's just there. But when you cut on the light, when you flip on the switch, darkness dispels and light takes over. It dominates. Amen? It's amazing. We may have a night, you know, time changed. And uh, I got caught the other day way down a trail in the woods in the dark and I was having to use my cell phone to get out of the woods running it was giving me just enough light not to trip over anything the thing about it was if I'd have stayed out there a few more hours I might have been cold but the sun was going to come up and light was going to dispel the darkness God teaches us in the very nature he has created regardless of what dark night we go through whether it's the pain of our own body suffering or family going through things or whatever that darkness might be that there's going to come a morning and joy is coming with it the sun is going to come up amen darkness doesn't have any power in itself it, it has no incumbent or absolute power of its own so evil is not a creation it is an aberration it is not the presence of something it's the absence of something namely it's the absence of light it's the absence of love it's the absence of truth and unity evil is not a power in itself as satan would try to lead men to believe he had a choice just like we have a choice the responsible use of choice was to worship and serve God. Instead, he chose to worship and serve self. The universe is filled with the light of God, but here Lucifer has spread his wings, not now to cover the glory of God in reverence, but to stand between God and the earth and cast a shadow of darkness over the earth to attempt to cause this to be a dark place. You know, he, he uh, you remember the WWJD? I had this little kid in my church said it's the uh, DJWW, devil just won't win. Lucifer repels the light by his commitment to corruption, to wickedness, but still he has an office from which God has not entirely removed him. God has not yet fully judged him his final hearing is set for the future. Um, Sister Ellen Sue greatly gave us this, uh, this little illustration. Just walk through it real quick. I will be as God. I, I will possess God's glory. I will have all in subjection to me. I will exercise authority. I will occupy heaven. And if you'll see the stair steps, there is pride, position, rule, idolizing dazzling equality we got three scriptures there but then he is going to the lake of fire the scripture says in proverbs what comes what comes after pride a fall in the mystery of god's ways he chose to create on the ashes of lucifer's rebellion another layer of creatures called man and use them as a part of the process of Lucifer's judgment and to use his dealings with Lucifer as a means of purifying them. God created us. That's why it's so important. When we come in here and it's music time, we let the devil have it because that was his role and it's been given over to us and we need to give God everything we got. Amen. We need to praise and worship him. 
and brother joseph gets on those drums he needs to beat the fire out of those drums for god you know david talked about praise him in the timbrel and the dance and the tambourine and and so many instruments i don't even know what they are because they don't exist anymore if i could find some of them we'd put some on stage or maybe give you some we'd get one of them you know you know i don't know maybe they have one of those in the bible i don't even know what that's called juke harp or something i don't know anyway lord help me with that and to use his dealings with lucifer as a means of purifying them the judgment of the angels that rebel with lucifer will be simultaneous with the judgment of sinful man somehow the redemption and triumph of man is related to the fall and judgment of satan so where are we now we're living in a war zone we're living in a spiritual war zone until the time of that judgment we're living in a war zone the focus of our struggle is not however with lucifer but it's over the souls of men the church is called to make disciples to preach the gospel to every creature there is not struggle between lucifer and god there's no cosmic conflict there's no skirmish in one corner of the universe exclusively in this galaxy and in our solar system the only one with the extensive line of planets here a band of rebel angels have made a nest in the heavens above the planet attempting to block out the glory and the light of god we learned that in Ephesians chapter 6. He's the prince of the power of the air. You remember us reading that in the scriptures? Casting a shadow of darkness over the planet. And this was possible since man, the custodial creature of the planet, entered into a conspiracy with these rebel angels. It was over a piece of fruit, by the way. God is not wringing his hands. He's not pacing heaven. He is not anxious. The struggle was acted out by Christ when our God, uh, uh, who revealed himself as a warrior God on our behalf, wrapped himself in flesh and waged war with Satan in the flesh for the redemption of man. And Jesus beat the devil with the ugly stick called the cross. And Satan and death was defeated at the cross sin lost its hold at the blood that was shed on the cross we won our victory at the cross some 2,000 years ago so when we are saved Satan is defeated already but he wants to convince us that we're not that we have to keep wrestling with him and the same things over and over no we do not we have victory over him because of what Jesus did for us on the cross amen yes give him praise Watch my time. see jesus fought the battle for us he has given us his victory knowing that he knowing that we could not win the war ourselves now we are aided by the word of god we're aided by the holy spirit and even angels encamp around the those who fear the lord and god himself helps us with his strong right arm and david said goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life so we're covered we are covered yet he himself has never moved off his throne the breath of his mouth subdues his enemies he exhales and thereby decimates his foes god doesn't have to lift a hand he just speaks and it does so important for us to by faith pray because that is what moves the hand of God to move the things that's going on in this world. The focus of the revival into which God is leading us is the restoration of the church to the end that we can complete the Great Commission because this is at, the, at cross purposes with Lucifer's goals inevitably we find ourselves in conflict but that conflict is not primary it is secondary warfare is not our calling the reconciliation of men to christ is what we're called to do and if god can get it through us 
he can get it to us and often instead of being a flowing river we become a Johnston County stagnant pond Lord help us I'm going to read this last slide. The focus of the revival into which God is leading us is the restoration of the church to the end that we complete the Great Commission because this is at cross with the purposes of Lucifer's goals. He wants to destroy. Inevitably, we find ourselves in conflict, but this conflict, it is what? It's not primary, it's secondary. Warfare is not our calling. We do have to do it from time to time. But our calling is to reconcile men to the same Jesus that loved us so much and gave himself for us. Would you stand to your feet? Would you raise both hands? And would you just honor the presence of our holy God? Lord, we lift you up in this place. We praise you. We thank you for victory over the devil. Father, Satan would so want to convince us that he has won. He would so want to convince us that he can beat us, that we are defeated. He does come against us. He is that roaring lion. His job is to steal and to kill and destroy but God, it does not take away from, it does not subtract from the biblical truth that you sent Jesus to give us life more abundantly. That greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. That we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That Satan is put in his place and that is under our feet. God, that your people tonight would put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the evil wiles of the devil. Oh God, that we would couple this armor with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Lord God, that we would pray for a brand new outpouring, a modern contemporary last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit Lord that will fall on all flesh that our sons and daughters will prophesy young men will see visions old men will dream dreams Lord ignite the souls of your people with your fire God give us a boldness to stand against the works of the devil and help us be convinced in you that Satan has already been defeated in Christ and we are victorious. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen, amen. You are dismissed.